the link, local station board election information, where you will find instructions as well as my contact information for further directions. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your commitment to KPFA. And this is 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1.30. Up next, Miking Contact. This week on Making Contact. Creating the spike culture, strengthening that in the black community and offering that as an alternative and being empowering was something that was really important to us. Riding bikes and healthy living, eating organic food and getting back to the land. The environmental movement is no longer on the fringes of American society, but one major stereotype remains. The image of that movement is mostly white. Neighbors helped each other. I remember hog killing days. Everybody would go to House A and help them with their hog killing. And then maybe next week someone else would do theirs and everybody went over there to help them with theirs. On this edition, we bring you stories of African Americans using the environment as a platform to advance the health and well-being of their communities. I'm Kyung Jin Lee, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, vital ideas, and important information. What a worm worm gas is made out of. Scoop. That's a scoop. (laughs) If you close your eyes and picture an American farmer, what color is their skin? How about a city dweller? If the media and our popular culture are any guide, that farmer is probably white, and the urban person may be black. It's ironic because until the Great Migration in the first half of the 20th century, most African Americans lived their entire lives on farms. But when millions of blacks headed north, they settled in the cities where there was work to be found. In largely rural Wisconsin, the state's Department of Agriculture says out of more than 73,000 farms in operation, only 63 are owned by African Americans. But a few of those remaining black farmers are trying to reconnect the black community with their not-so-distant past and help improve the community's health in the process. From Madison, Zoe Sullivan has the story. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Welcome. Good. How are you doing? I'm all right. We're at the Boys and Girls Club on Madison's south side, a neighborhood with large African-American and Latino populations. Robert Pierce is a Madison native. He's one of only a handful of black farmers in the state, Pierce is tall and barrel-chested. He has a good-natured laugh, but he's serious about his passion for organic farming and community empowerment. Pierce is working with the Boys and Girls Club to teach farming practices to local youth of color. You know, we're not only teaching people how to how to grow food, teaching them how to cook, how to prepare, because it's not just good enough to know how to eat it. you got to learn how to cook it right. You know, because the bottom line is if you eat good from the beginning... Down the road, it would be better for you in the end here that you may not suffer all the other you know, ailments of diabetes and heart attacks and heart failures and all these other things if you eat right from the beginning. So we need to start teaching kids how to eat right from the beginning, you know. My thing is you can't teach an old dog no tricks, so get to the puppies, you know, teach the puppies. Pierce's own family has been in Madison since the 1930s and helped establish one of the city's prominent black churches. Even in the city, though, Pierce was drawn to the land. We were always put gardens in, you know, we always had big, huge gardens. My grandmother was that way. We had to have these huge gardens. And it was like a time when she would, you know, tell us everything about the families and stuff like that. So there was always that time of uh, hanging out in the garden with Grandma and so you could learn more about the family. The farmer's markets Pierce runs are important nexuses for the community. Pierce's daughter, Shelly, was running an early spring market on the Park Street thoroughfare. This community over here, it's known as a food desert. All of our markets are placed in food deserts where there's a lot of gas stations, but they're not actual, like, good local good food that you can get and, um, you know, and not pay so much for it. Pierce explains that area residents find more at the market than just good food. They usually sometimes come and sit for a very long time and just chit-chat with us, which is, we, we appreciate that, at, you know, at all given times. But 
um, they we see that they it kind of likes to day up, especially when it gets warm. That they can just walk out, sit, eat an apple, eat a you know eat some watermelon right here with us. And sometimes we have you know music. And so it's kind of like a way for them to kind of get out and not have to deal with whatever they're going through at home. Wisconsin has one of the highest incarceration rates of African Americans in the country. Professor Pam Oliver of the University of Wisconsin Madison reported 47 percent of African American males in Wisconsin between the ages of 25 and 29 were either in prison or on parole in 2006. A Wisconsin Office of Justice Assistant study showed African Americans were arrested at roughly 11 times the rate of whites for violent crimes in 2008. In this context, Pierce's work takes on greater significance. He's been running a farmer's market on the south side of Madison for eight years. He trains about a dozen youth each year and serves almost 100 people daily in each of his five markets. In spite of his efforts to promote self-sufficiency and positive living, Pierce has been challenged. And so uh, I get here and the guy, uh, the building's surrounded. And they go, uh, you got two, uh, you have two, two uh, offices in there. He says, yeah. And uh, I said, well, we want to look at him. I said, for what? He says, uh, we believe you're dealing drugs. And I said, so, this is uh, 2010. We have a black president, and I just had dinner with Michael Pollan, and I'm a drug dealer. Oh, okay. So they concluded that I wasn't a drug dealer by the time they were finished, and all I had was a bunch of vegetables. Pierce says he hasn't been bothered since, but it wasn't the first time something like this happened. Even if he's not being harassed, though, others are. Will Allen, another black farmer in Milwaukee, founded Growing Power, a national food justice organization that's become a model for urban agriculture. Like Pierce, he started in a low-income African-American community plagued with problems. Here, interns at Growing Power headquarters in Milwaukee are throwing trays of shoots into a compost bin. <laughs> on the day I visited, Alan is out at another site, but there's plenty of activity going on. Javier Vasquez is an intern at Growing Power. These are pea shoots, and the other ones are sunflower sprouts, and we divide them up because of the rate of comp decomposition. So and, um, if you want to even smell the soil and check what is ready and what is not, and if you smell like that manure-y smell to it, it means it's not ready, but someone pulled it anyways. No, they're bad, but we sell the pea shoots and uh, the sunflower sprouts, and this is the byproduct. Instead of you know throwing it away or putting it in compost pile, we actually reuse it, and the soil is even more fertile than it was before. Vasquez's family owns a 40-acre farm not far from Milwaukee. The urban agriculture experience is a way for him to learn new techniques. He's not the only one who's come for this reason. On the day of my visit, a group of fellows from Kenya and Uganda are wrapping up an educational stay with Growing Power. Paris Mogo is an agricultural extension officer in Nairobi. She supports farmers as they learn and adopt new methods. We met in one of the greenhouses where a hydroponic system is in place. I ask Mogo if what she's learned will be useful in Kenya. Very useful because I only need to adapt the same system into our local condition. We may not be able to do it in the sophisticated way it's done, but the principles behind it can be applied in our environment. Yes. I intend to start farming from my household. I've seen you don't require land. You only require space to grow food. On top of the concrete, you can grow food in trays and harvest the food from your kitchen. It can be done. It will be done. I want to start from my house, as I extend to other farmers. Since the Back to the Land movement in the 60s and 70s, growing one's own food has become popular in cities. Pierce and Allen's work building social equity through a core state industry, farming, is modeling a more sustainable lifestyle for urban dwellers. They're extending the health and self-sufficiency of urban populations of color who have less access to resources than the flower children did. For Making Contact, this is Zoe Sullivan. For those African Americans who stayed in the South, maintaining their agricultural traditions wasn't always easy. 
Tillery, North Carolina, is a small rural town in the northeast part of the state. It was once a vibrant farming community where families work together collectively. The town also has a long history of challenging racism going back to Reconstruction. The film We Shall Not Be Moved details many of Tillery's struggles for racial and environmental justice. Once a plantation worked by slaves, Tillery, North Carolina, became a resettlement community during the 1930s as part of Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal programs. The Tillery Resettlement Farm was one of the largest resettlement projects in the country, and it provided black farmers who had been sharecropping the opportunity to buy the land they lived and worked on. You take someone who is digging in their what they know is going to be their own garden, who's chopping and plowing and what they know is going to be their own field. And for those who had always dreamed of being independent, they thought they had died and gone to heaven. The resettlement program was not free of racism. Blacks received smaller plots than whites. Black farmers, unlike whites, had to lease their land for three to five years, while government agents judged their ability to manage these experienced farmers could not make their own decisions. Some called this sharecropping for the government. Despite these challenges, the Tillery Resettlement Community began succeeding, thanks in part to collective farming practices. My dad's farm hadn't finished with his peanuts. And so it's, and, and, uh, we had a man named Mr. Jabbo. Mr. Jabbo had finished his, but Mr. Jabbo would come over and help my dad to finish his crop. The first wave of resettlers were local sharecroppers, some of them descended from Tillery plantation slaves. But there were too few of them, so the resettlement administration opened the program to families from neighboring counties. The second wave of resettlers, farmers occupied every parcel, and the community began to flourish. Until the autumn of 1940. We used to call them economics. But now they named them hurricanes. And it just rained and rained, and then they didn't know that the water was going to be strong enough to break through that dam. I believe there were 103 farm families that were purchasing at that time, and 93 of those families lost everything. Along with the catastrophe of the flood came a backlash in the U.S. Congress against the land reform ideals of the resettlement program. The Resettlement Administration was replaced by the more conservative Farmers Home Administration with much stricter supervised loans. And a third wave of black farmers came from all over the southeast. The white man could go in there and get his money early, like February, and we'd be like the last of April and up to May getting our little money. And that's the little part I saw. My mother was extremely pretty by Western standards. They would go to the bank, and all the way to the bank, he would be instructing her. We have 500 acres of peanuts. We will make so much on the bag, so much on the pound. We have 250 acres of cotton. We have 500 acres of corn. They would DC to introduce my mother, and the bank banker was quite taken with her. The banker would direct all his questions to Mama. And she allowed herself to be used that way so that for the good of the family. And it was only when he borrowed money from FHA that he got in trouble. He had been borrowing from the bank all these years and uh, had always successfully paid his loans off. The FMHA, or the Farmers Home Administration, is the lender of last resort when farmers can't get bank loans because of natural disasters or other forces. The agency had a critical flaw. Decision-making power on loans rested in local committees made up almost entirely of powerful white landowners. Their bias against blacks combined with the national policy favoring large farms over small, spelled trouble for Tillery's farmers and others like them. We are no, so foreclosure. We, we lost our way of life, uh, our, our, um, oh, our credit, all the credit, all our means to, to uh, produce crops. He never acted like a broken man, but he was, he was totally devastated. As we found out what was happening to us, we found out that that's what had been happening to a lot of the rest of the farmers. They had just been closed-mouthed about it. Our struggle for land 
to save farmers and their land began in 1976 when the foreclosures began here in Tillery. And then it reached out into other uh, counties and before we knew it we were actually dealing within the eastern region of North Carolina. Then as we began to understand the struggle here, we began to understand that it was just not North Carolina but that this was a national problem of black people losing land and all. Out of the 300 farm families that were here, none of the original people are farming and none of their children are farming. We basically can say that we have no one from the resettlement because the government drove us all out. The number of school children drastically decreased due to the outmigration of most of the town's residents. The school board then moved to close the local school down. The community was not willing to give up its center without a struggle. Parents asked Gary Grant for help, and they organized the concerned citizens of Tillery to fight for their school. We began to organize around saving the school, and we were actually able to keep it open until 1981. When the school was finally closed, we were told that we were getting economic development, and we had a slew of uh, sewing factories that came through. Of course, we never saw any real benefit from it, but it was also the prelude to other forms of, uh, quote, economic development. Many schemes emerged in Tillery, from business startups to prisons to factory farming. But none have benefited the people of Tillery. Probably one of the worst things that has happened to us as a result of the outmigration of our children and the farming becoming so mechanized is that eventually we get another form of economic development called hog farming. People didn't know what bringing any hog farming to this community would do to their health. You know, when, when you're dealing with some 10,000 hog in one spot with those lagoon, you know, this, the, 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 the smell is, is, is overwhelming. Then you got flies, you know, and then the lagoon infiltrated in the, in the ground and get the, the water. The fight against factory hog farms led to a statewide moratorium. After organizing to save its school, the community took the lead on other statewide and national struggles. Black farmers gathered in Washington, D.C. in 1996 to protest racist government lending policies. They formed the Black Farmers and Agriculturalists Association with CCT and Gary Grant in the vanguard. This is about land. The concerned citizens of Tillery, once it has lost the school, they must organize around saving the land that was supposed to afford the opportunities to the families. And we created the Land Loss Fund. The organization filed and won a class action lawsuit against the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We would say that we won the lawsuit, but at the same time that we lost because of the way that the government has hampered farmers from being able to uh, actually get through the process and claim their awards for the damage that had been done to them. We have now 864 cases still to be resolved. All of the work that you've been doing for the time that you've been in Congress, only 224 have been resolved. It is planting season. Mm -hmm. And you have farmers that are there. That's right. In this 864 who have been waiting 10, 15, and 20 years, we have people who have died waiting. We have people who have had heart attacks, who have died brokenhearted waiting for their government. Since the 1930s when people started moving here to buy their land and the 1940s when we had the final wave of people to come in, there, it's been a struggle just to, you know, to wreak out a living, to take care of your family. Even now, as our ancestors sang, that we shall not be moved, we know that if we want to have a community that is alive, that is a wonderful place to live, and to carry on the traditions of those who have come before us and those whose shoulders we stand on, that we too must sing the song, We Shall Not Be Moved. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. Because of listeners like you, this show is distributed for free to radio stations in the U.S., Canada, and South Africa. 
to find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. Like Making Contact on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Our handle is Making underscore Contact. We now return to our program, Being Black and Green, African Americans and the Environment. It's been almost 20 years since the first critical mass bike ride. The large public ride, part protest, part celebration, part advocacy, now takes place in more than 300 cities every month. The ride continues in the San Francisco Bay Area, where the first critical mass took place. But it spawned some offshoots with smaller groups of participants and more focused goals. A group of African Americans in the city of Oakland have created a local biking crew as a means to address issues affecting their community. It's called Red Biking Green. They attract a lot of attention when they ride, and they're making a difference in the community. Making Contact's Alton Bird spoke with founders of Red Biking Green, Jenna Burton and Nick James. Red Biking Green is essentially a collective of black people riding bikes in the East Bay, uh, mainly in Oakland and Berkeley. And what we do is build community, we promote health, sustainability, and it's just all about camaraderie and support. I know that the three colors are symbolic. Uh, Maybe you can say a little bit more about that. Right, well, Red, Black, and Green is a play on the Pan-African colors, which are red, black, and green. Um, And since we are about upliftment in the black community, then it made sense to creatively come up with the name Red, Black, and Green. You know, I love the idea that this is not a a cycling team where everybody's in Lycra or spandex and have expensive bikes. It seems to be more of a, a great collection of everyday people, you know, getting together to have fun. Um, the Oakland Yellow Jackets seem to be a more, um, forgive me, professional cyclist group. But again, how is, how is RBG different? Red Bike and Green is different in that, you know, we're about participation and not presentation. We really want anybody who has a bicycle to come out to the rides and really be a symbol of uplift and change in the black community. We're that middle ground, whereas We're not trying to be the expert. We're just trying to bridge these beginners who really want to be a part of it but haven't found a space to do it. And I think that's why we have, you know, people from fixie bikes to beach cruisers to mountain bikes, you know, the whole nine. If you have a bike, come on and you can ride with us because we're not about a particular type of biker. We want someone who's 66 to someone who's age six. I understand that some of the RBG rides um, were described as a a black critical mass. Why was there a need to create one? Us really being downtown or being anywhere in Oakland really sends a message that we're here. You know, we're not invisible um, and we're going to enjoy the city that we live in. So this black critical mass becomes a symbol and becomes like a social sculpture, really like Kevin City in the city of Oakland. And that's why we call it a black critical mass. Also, the notion of it excites folks because it's been amazing the fact that people haven't really had a concept of just uh, a regular bunch of African-American folks on bikes going through the city. When you hear the term critical mass, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind for me is um, the predominantly white biking culture, especially in the Bay Area. We called it a black critical mass because it was our way of saying that this activity doesn't necessarily have to be dominated by white people. It can be open to um, people of color and it can be open to black people. (laughs) Paint us a picture of a, a typical RBG ride. Our rides are about 15 miles and it's It'll take us about two hours to do 15 miles because the pace is super casual and 
we wait for everyone. No one gets left behind. I mean, people、um, come out on bikes that they found in their their cousin's backyard, and so you know it's falling apart. And so we'll just stop and put the bike back together again and get on the road. And so it's always this community effort, and that's why it feels so good at, at the end of the ride. And it, it happens every single time. Like it just pulls us closer and closer together. I heard that Red Bike and Green has a three-point program comprising of health, economics, and the environment, and I'd like to explore those points right now.、Um, health. Why was it important to address the issue of health? I think it was it was the first thing that we thought about, given the state of health in the black community. When I was teaching in West Oakland, the amount of asthma. There's a lot of respiratory issues, primarily because of the pollution in West Oakland, to dietary issues and lack of exercise, and there's even、um, certain vitamin deficiencies from not even getting sunlight. With health, it was a no-brainer that we're suffering far more than any other ethnic group in this country, and if we don't do it through behavior and lifestyle changes, we're really going to continue to suffer. Yeah, and you know what Nick said about、um, asthma and about pollution in the air, and that touches on、um, the environmental component of the three-point plan. And for the economic part, we had to watch it develop on its own. I mean, initially the idea was that bike riding is it's pretty much free. I mean, once you make that initial investment in In the bike, but after that, you're you're pretty much free to get around、um, without worrying about the cost that you incur with any other mode of transportation. And so that was really important to me because the black community is suffering financially, and creating this bike culture, strengthening that in the black community, and offering that as an alternative and, and being empowering was something that was really really important to us. And we have a you know someone who's a part of. The collective Brian Drayton, who creates programs where you get to build bikes and then sell those bikes, it not only gives them an entrepreneurial spirit, but it changes their health because they're riding all the time, and they're really a part of something. I think more programming like that needs to be in the city of Oakland, so, so youth can then be the the precipice of change, where they're going to create the bike culture that's going to last for generations. So for me, I think the goal is to incorporate the youth as much as possible. But see what we can do programmatically, so that youth have more access to bicycles and the development of bicycles.、Uh, finally,、um, is there anything else people should know about your organization? What I would like for people to know about Red Bike and Green is we are a group of black cyclists that are really trying to enjoy the space that we live and inhabit. Born and raised in Oakland, I remember hundreds to almost a thousand kids at Dufferin Park every summer with a plethora of services that are now being cut. And it's really been harder to to enjoy the city of Oakland, and we're gonna have to really take it back on our own in terms of creating interesting programming and forms of recreation and leisure that gets people out enjoying themselves. And I think Red Bike and Green is a component of that. We're a part of that, trying to create spaces on our own, but no money, really providing something for people. And we're gonna have to have that model to really make Oakland thrive. Of what can I do with my talent、um, or idea that I have? That can help others. I've been speaking to Jenna Burton and Nick James, the founders of Red Bike and Green. Thank you for speaking with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And that's it for this edition of Making Contact. For a CD copy of this program, call the National Radio Project at 800-529-5736, or check out our website at radioproject.org to get a podcast, download past shows, or make a difference by supporting our work. Like Making Contact on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Our handle is Making Underscore Contact. We close today's show with a special thanks and farewell to our associate director, Con Pham. She's been an important member of our team over the last three years, and we wish her luck as she goes off to graduate school. Thanks for listening to Making Contact.
KPFA is proud to co-sponsor Yoshi's Jazz Fest. Yoshi's, the renowned jazz venue here in the Bay Area for 40 years. Yoshi's Jazz Fest is an outdoor event open to the public on Oakland's waterfront at Jack London Square, Sunday, August 26th, noon to 5 p.m. Featuring the John Santos Sextet, Oakland 